patience. It's the reason that I praise. It's a celebration. Every time I hear your name, I got this revelation of all you've done for me. You set my soul on fire. It's the reason that I can't wait to get to the house, join in the praise, lift up a song with the angels and saints. Ain't got no time to hesitate, cause I'm burning just to say, I found freedom. This is freedom. Better than a thousand elsewhere Your love keeps 
keeps on running. It keeps on running. It keeps on running after me. Yes, you do. 
time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. I was just so sick and tired of being where we were at. I was living paycheck to paycheck. You just stayed right in the lane where they wanted you. People change their lives when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and they finally say, that's it, I've had it! What I love about this plan is it gives you a clear path. This is a wealth building plan. It's not just a get out of debt plan. A budget is simply a plan for your money. You deal with the money stuff, and all of a sudden, you find freedom and connection everywhere. I feel like I can do more things than I ever could. You can go from where you are to where you want to be. You're free. You just got to get started. Make 2024 your best financial year ever and sign up for this life-changing course at BonitaValley.com slash FPU. 
Financial Peace University begins this Monday, January 22nd at 6.30 p.m. in the Fireside Room of the Life Center. Membership matters. Everyone who attends Bonita Valley can count on BVCC. Members are those Bonita Valley can count on. Pastor Jeff will be teaching the next 101 Membership Seminar on Sunday, February 4th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. A casual meal and childcare will be provided. Sign up online at bonitavalley.com slash base class. Are you exhausted as a parent? Are you tired of the kids bossing you around? Yeah. Then you need to come to the Parents Rising Conference. The Parents Rising Conference? Yeah. It's a one-day event to help your child in this crazy culture. Who's speaking? Dr. Gary Chapman, Arlene Pelicane, Bill and Pam Farrell, and Sally Burke. The Parents Rising Conference happens Saturday, March 2nd. To register for this event, stop by happyhomeuniversity.com. An early bird discount is available now, but expires January 31st. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe he wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BBCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325, or by mailing your offering to BBCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center Gym. Bonita Valley Youth also hosts classes at 9 and 11 a.m. for students in middle and high school in the Fireside Room. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. This weekend, I want to continue a series we started a couple of weeks ago. Like, we're already more than halfway through January as we start the first month of a brand new year. And the series we're in is simply titled, Choosing a Great New Year. Now, if you weren't here from week one, the gist of this title is that New Year's just happen. They're automatic. They're like birthdays. Like, you don't have to do anything. This, it's coming. No matter what, ready or not, here comes another year. But great years are not automatic. Great years are always chosen. They're selections we make by the choices we make in life. And so we're talking about choices that will make our year and make our life. And that's really what this series is about. And getting started in a new year is about starting new choices. And, and so this weekend, I want to set up where we're going for the next few moments uh, with a little, little survey, actually it was done a few years ago, of Americans, and I'm going to try it with you. It's a survey on American habits. So I want to get a little personal. I want to ask you about your habits, and I want you to answer these questions as honestly as you can. And, and here's the first one. When making a P&J sandwich, that's peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which is one of the few things I make. Like I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cook. You know, like I'll, I'll make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for myself. I'll make chocolate toast. Uh, I'll grill an occasional hot dog. Like, I, I'm a gourmet. Yeah, so, so I, I make a few things. So when you're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, here's my question. What do you put on the top piece of bread? The jelly or the peanut butter? Survey says 4% of Americans say the jelly. 96% say peanut butter. Yeah. 
That makes sense because it sticks because you put it on time and the jelly drops. So, so yeah, so, so most people get that right. Okay. Um, second question. Do you put your socks in the drawer rolled up or folded flat? Yeah. I got to ask my wife. No, my wife does. Like, like I, don't, I, don't, I don't do this. So, so here, here's the survey says 51% roll them up. That's my wife rolls them up. 49% fold them flat. Like when I actually have to do my own socks, I just try to find two that match. That's my goal. Like, because I get a long one and a short one and different colors. And, and so it's just match them up. Okay, let, let me, let's keep moving. Question number three. Do you ever bite your fingernails? Mm. 96% of Americans say they do at one time or another. A lot of people. I'm in the 4% that doesn't. I, I, I don't know that I've ever bitten my fingernails. Uh, that's why they invented fingernail clippers. But, but anyway, so, so no, but, but 96% of you occasionally or regularly do that. Uh, let's keep moving. Do you ever bite your toenails? <laughs> Survey says... 25% of Americans have a nasty habit. That is horrible. It really is. It's like, like, it's one thing with a little kid in a stroller and get their foot in their mouth, but like for big people, now, I have never done that either. And, and part of it's disgusting, but the real reason is I'm not that flexible. Like I can't get my foot all the way to my mouth. Um, yeah, so moving on. Do you squeeze the toothpaste tube from the top or the bottom? 72% squeeze from the top, 28% from the bottom. There was no middle, so I just grab it wherever you grab it. Now, habits are something every one of us have. More than we know. More of our life is more habitual, more habit-driven than many of us realize. In fact, it's, studies are done and researches are done, and so much study is done on habits usually by retailers, because they're trying to sell us stuff based on our habits. And one of the, the studies, the major studies on habits, has, has discovered that almost 50% of everything you and I do every day is a habit. It's not the conscious decision choice we make in that moment. I choose this in the moment. No, we do it by habit. Now, we do choose it because we started the habit at one point, but once we start the habit, it's like automatic pilot. The habit drives us. The habit decides what we do. Almost half of what we do on a daily basis is a habit. Now, one of the, again, the, the idea, neurologists, researchers, behaviors, their conclusion is, and, and they've studied the brain, and their conclusion is that we create habits. Our brain does this for efficiency and effectiveness. That once we've learned something, our brain will, what they call chunking it, it'll put it together. Once I've learned it, it'll chunk it so that in the future, I don't have to keep learning it every time. I've learned that one. And, and the brain will put, it's like autofill. Have you seen that on, on like your phone or your computer and you start a word, it fills it in? Our brain does that. It looks for phrases, lines that we've used, things that we have learned to help us be more efficient and more effective so we don't have to learn it again every time we do it. And this works on little things in life. It works on things such as, as, as tying our shoes. I don't know how many of you, I had to tie my boots. I have to tied your shoes this morning. Did you stop and say, now the, the rabbit runs around the tree this way or that? No, like you learned however you learned it. Did you start to the right or the left? Whatever it is, it's your habit. So you go, what do I do? Because you don't even think about it anymore. When you button your shirt, you start at the top or the bottom. I don't know, but your habit. And you didn't consciously say, today I start at the top. No, because you've, you've learned that. How many learned as a kid, if you have a shirt, the logo goes in the front. The tag is like the things on back. Have you seen children, with, when they haven't learned yet, their toes and their boots go out. Like, no, the toes go. So once you learn that, and so there's all kind of brushing our teeth. You don't have to uh, get toothpaste. No, once you've learned it, and you start it, your brain says, I know this, it chunks it, and you do it. Now, not just simple behaviors. Our brain does this on complex things. We have habits in very complex behaviors in our life, such as driving. Now, early on, driving takes a lot of concentration, a lot of work, a lot of our mind. 
And early on, man, it takes up a lot of your mind. And later on, when you learn how to drive, you drive mindlessly. At least a lot of people do. So, so, but, but the things you had, to, I'll prove it. How many of you, you have the same route to, to work or to church or to shopping or to wherever you go, and your brain knows that, and as soon as you start, you, and on your day off, you go to the same place. You start going there. Have you ever gone to work or to school or to a regular place, and you don't even remember driving there? Like, like I know where I'm going, and then you're there. Have you ever, did I stop at that light? Did I go through that? Because our brain chunks. We know that. We know this route. We know this routine. And it chunks it. So even complex things like driving and other things we do at work or in life or family, our brain is constantly trying to chunk these things so that, because if we had to think about everything we do every time we did it from the start, it would kind of, we don't have the bandwidth. And and we want to save that extra bandwidth of our brain for shopping on Amazon or binging on Netflix, no, for, for things that are really valuable. We talked last weekend about our core values, the things that matter most in our life. And so we, we create habits so we can do some things automatically so we can do the most important things the most thoughtfully and engaged. In fact, let me kind of give you the bottom line of this message. And the reason I'll sometimes do that is because I know some of you will check out early. I don't mean you'll leave, but mentally, like, like, listen, you're not fooling me. I know the lights are on, but we're not always home. Okay, so it's like, so I want to, I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you before we go there, and if you leave, you'll know what you hear that wah, 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 going on in the background. Okay, so, so here's here's what this whole weekend's message is all about. Get this, and you're going to start moving forward in your life. And here's here's the statement: the quality of our life depends in great part on the quality of our habits. Now, I took that whole introduction to tell you how much of our life, as much as 50% of what you and I do on a daily basis is habit. So if almost half of what you do every day is a habit, how many of you think that those habits determine and define the quality of your life? So, if you want to upgrade the quality of your life, of your year, of every area of your life, you need to upgrade your habits. Building better habits is what we're going to talk about for the next few moments. Because if habits are what define and direct what's going to happen to us and through us and in us, then you and I need to build the best. And the Bible is all about that. The Bible has so much insight and instruction when it comes to the habits of our life. And we're going to talk just for a few moments about two of the principles, two of the practices Scripture gives us to build the best. You already got habits. Like, you don't have to build a habit. You've built them. You've built hundreds of them. But we haven't always built the best ones. So let's talk about the first practice to building the best habit, the best life, the best year, and it's this. Practice number one, regularly examine them. we got to regularly examine our habits, exactly what David does. He teaches us to do. See, he didn't just do it himself. He taught his whole nation, and he taught us. The Psalms are the songbooks of, and and they're songbooks of truth and principles. Watch this. Psalm 139, verse 23. David prays. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Know what's going on on the inside of me. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, what I'm thinking, what worries me the most, my fears. And see if there be any, say it out loud, hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting, what? Way. Don't miss this. He said there are two ways in my life. There are two ways I live. One is hurtful, the other is helpful. One is is destroying, the other is life-giving. David realized when he talks about way, he's talking about habits. The ways that I live, not just an action I did, not an an event in my life, the way of my life. The way of my life are the habits, the routines, the routes of my life. And David says, God, examine me. And God, in your presence, help me to examine me. Do you know how many times the Bible says, examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself? 
That's what you don't need to, to stop and examine. And when David starts examining his ways before God, he comes to the understanding that you and I need to come to that habits are a good news, bad news deal. The bad news is we all have bad ones. In fact, let's do a little mass confession here. Now, we're not Catholic, but let's confess anyway as a group. How many of you have at least one bad habit in your life you need to deal with? Raise your hand. And if you didn't raise your hand, your habit is bad habit is you don't tell the truth. So we, we all have them. If you say, I really can't think of one, just ask your spouse. They'll help you. Your kids will help you. Your friends will help you if they, if they will tell you the truth. Now, we have stuff... We have stuff that drives people crazy that we don't even know drives them crazy. Like there's habits, there's routines, there's things we do. So, so, so you and I need to understand that, that habits can be hurtful. Habits can be limiting. And sometimes we need to stop and recognize, like, what am I doing that's actually hurting me and it's hurting others? Sometimes more than I know. God, show me. God, help me to see them. Help me to face them. Help me. Uh. So that's the bad news of habits. We have bad ones. The good news of habits is bad habits, in fact, all habits, but especially bad habits, are sticky. But we are not stuck with them forever. Because how many know that bad habits can be broken? And new habits can replace them. Now, habits are deep. Those, again, neurologists, they can study this down in our brain. Your brain creates routes and paths, and they are in there. And, and to some degree, once you have a habit, you will always have it. To, 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 I mean, I've heard it's just like riding a bike. What does that mean? Once you learned it, even if you haven't ridden a bike in years, now you might not ride it as well, but you kind of know, are you with me? And, and, and so that's why sometimes we haven't done something in years and we'll start it and, and I can do it again. Why? Because you have these deep channels in your brain. So there's a degree to which that doesn't go away, but I can replace it with stronger channels stronger routes and stronger paths and stronger habits. That's what best habits can be in our life. And the good news is we're not stuck with our bad habits. You and I can experience better habits and a better life. And to do that, we need to examine them. And examining them is really questioning them. And I want to give you just two questions that I really believe you and I need to ask ourselves on a regular basis. But I think especially early in a year is a great time to do it. Because it's a new calendar, it's a new year. And we stop and ask ourselves these two questions. First, what are the long-term consequences of my current habits? What's the long-term consequence of what I'm doing, the good one or the bad one? We talked last weekend about our value choices and decisions, and, and we talked about play the movie. Look down the road. Do your best to bring the future into the present tense. And that same truth applies to our habits, but let me give you a different word picture for it, and it comes right out of Scripture. This comes again from the Apostle Paul's challenge in Galatians. Watch this on the screens in your Bibles, Galatians 6, verse 7. Paul writes, you will always, what? Harvest what you, what? Plant. You will always reap what you sow. What you plant, you'll reap. What you sow, you'll harvest. There's a, that's the law of the harvest. It happens everywhere, every area of life. What you sow, you'll reap. He continues, verse 8. Those who live only or sow only to their sinful nature will harvest decay and death. You plant bad things, you get bad things from that sinful nature. But those who live or sow to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting what? Life. From the Spirit. So Paul says, farmers consider what they're going to sow. What crop do you want? You've got to consider what do I want in life, and that determines what we, you and I sow in life. Now, how many know it's a law? It's a law of God, like, 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 like gravity. There are laws that God has put in place, and there's the law of the harvest. There's a miracle in a seed. It is amazing. And the miracle of the seed is what you plant, you will harvest. Now, let's, let's get real. It's just us, trying to be honest. This is, this is mass confession number two. Okay, mass confession number two. How many have ever planted a bad seed on Saturday night and prayed for crop failure on Sunday morning? Oh, God, don't let this thing. Yeah. But Scripture says, what you plant, you'll reap. So you and I need to stop and say, are, are the habit seeds I'm planting healthy or unhealthy? 
Are they great or are they bad? Are they life-giving or are they life-limiting? Now, you, you've heard, I'm sure, there's an old saying about sowing that is still incredibly important and I believe incredibly powerful. We'll put it on the screens. You can read along with me. The saying says, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Everything you sow has a harvest to it. And ultimately, the destiny of our life is connected to the planting that we do of our thoughts, of our actions, of our habits, and of our character. That's how the law of sowing and reaping goes. That's how we bring the future into the present tense. That's how we ask ourselves, what, a, what seeds of habits have I, am I, do I want to plant? Which is the second question. What healthy habits do I need to sow and practice to experience the best, the biggest and best life? And God's word is absolutely full of the, the best seeds for the best life. It is full of actions and attitudes that you and I need to sow in our lives to reap the biggest, best life God has for us. And so let me walk you just through a few of them. It's a whole series, and I don't have time today to give you all of them because there's so many hundreds. But let me just give you just, just a handful. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, Paul writes, Train yourself to be what? Godly. Train yourself to be what? Godly. Okay. This Greek word train is where we get our English word gymnasium. It literally was like, like exercise. And, and, and in Paul's day, exercise was a huge thing, especially among the Greeks and the Olympics and the competitions they had. And, and they would go into strict training. He writes about that in Corinthians there was a 10-month contract you signed to train, to diet, all the things you would do for that competition so that when it happened, you were ready. You were your best. And so training was a big deal. It wasn't just like all, we have all these fitness clubs. They, it, was, it was the world, the, the Greek world. It was, it was part of how they functioned. And, 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 and the Italian were all. So Paul says to Timothy, train yourself, but not physically. That has some value, he says. But train yourself to godliness. What is that? To, to, to God's plan, to God's purposes, to God's likeness. Train yourself from the inside. The real you, the spiritual you, train it. Let me tell you something about Bonita Valley. I, I honestly believe we are a spiritual training center. That's what we're meant to be. Now, I know sometimes churches can be referred to, and, and we might refer to ourselves as a spiritual hospital. And, and thank God, I believe that Bonita Valley and I believe churches are meant to be healing places. But we're so much more than a hospital. For a couple of reasons. One, no one likes to go to the hospital. Two, you only go there when you're, when you're really bad. Like you got to be really bad to go to the hospital. And then you want to get out as soon as possible. So churches are kind of like hospitals. So you want to get out as soon as you can. But you only go there occasionally when you need to. Church is not an occasional thing to get fixed up. Church is a training center to grow up. To be the biggest and best we can be in every area of life. And if you hang around here long enough, we talk about so many things because there's so many aspects to our life. And we are committed at Bonita Valley to growing up in godliness and every, to training ourselves to God's best. In fact, we have four seminars we do in the spring and in the fall. It's our, our four base classes. It's 101, 201, 3 401. And, and we do them in the spring. We do them in the fall. We'll be doing them the first Sunday of February, first Sunday of March, first Sunday of April, first Sunday of May. I'll be doing the 101 that comes up. That's the membership connection, connecting to God and his family. I'll be doing that, I think it's February 4th, the first Sunday of February. And then Pastor Jordan does the, the, the one first Sunday of March, and it's our habits. It's our 201. Pastor Mike does the 301 in, in, in April, uh, and that's how we're shaped for significance. And then I'll do the, the mission, my mission in this world in May. We do them in the spring. We do them in the fall. Why? Because you and I have got to train ourselves for godliness. How do I, how do I become that? How do I commit to that? We, and, we, and, and why are there four? Because there's many dimensions to your life and mine. And to be healthy, we want to have the best balance in our life that we can possibly have. So we're a training center. Now, another habit Paul tells us to sow. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Excuse me, verse 3. He writes, No matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without what? 
love. So he says, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you Corinthians and you Californians that we're in here. I want to challenge you to sow the seed not of your love, but of God's love. See, you can't love until you've been loved. But once we're loved by God, the seed of God's love is in us. Now he wants us to sow that seed, to grow that seed. Let me show you. He continues. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, keeps going to the end. Now let me tell you something about this. The reason I call it God love because we don't love like that. If you think you do, just stick your name in every time it says love and put your name in there. I never, yeah, and see how far you get. If you're honest, not very far. And we go, out. Ah, see, because see, I, I don't love like that. Like, my default is self-centered. It's only God in me that can be God-centered and other-centered. So Paul says, you got to plant. God gives you the seed of his love. Now, you plant it. You grow it. You develop it. You experience it. But it's so important for us to plant right seeds if you want right harvests. Paul encourages the Corinthians. He encourages us. Another biblical seed is to sow a good money habit seed. You know there are over 2,000 verses in the Bible about money. 16 of the 38 parables Jesus shared all had to do with finances. Why? Because finances are at the heart of every single day. How much does it cost? What do we buy? What do we spend? Everything, money, money's not everything. It's just the next thing to it. It's so much of what happens happens with money. And we all have money habits. Everyone's got them. But not every money habit's a good one. And that's why we're doing, and it starts Monday night, just in time, David Ramsey's Financial Peace University. It's incredibly powerful. There are nine sessions. It starts this Monday night, so you haven't missed one session yet. Yes, you have to pay, not very much, but you pay a little bit because you got to get skin in the game. Because when we put money into it, you follow your money. And you follow to the class. I have gone through the class multiple times, and my only regret is I didn't do it sooner. Because there are money habits that will change your life, change your future, change your children, change your destiny. And most of the trouble we get in with money, let's get real, we have bad money habits. It's just how we do things with money. And many of us have never learned how to do the right things. And so it's, it's an incredibly practical, powerful, and as you heard early the video announcement, it's not just getting out of debt, it's building wealth, it's building value, it's building not just physical money, but, but the values of about money that God wants us to have. Because we're managers, we're not owners. And so it starts on Monday night. If you haven't signed up, you can still sign up. You can still show up. You can still be a part. It happens in what we call our, our, our life center. It's where the gymnasium is. And the second floor, the top floor, we call it the fireside room because it has a fireplace. Brilliant. So there's a fireplace, and that's the fireside room, the only place, and that's where it will be on Monday nights. And if you're serious about doing the best, if you want to sow the best money habits and reap the best money harvest, you show up. And you go through it and you commit to it because that's how you receive a harvest of great money results. Now, Paul continues. Another challenge. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So you must honor God with your what? Body. Not just your money, not just your time, your body. Now, earlier he told Timothy, train yourself for godliness because physical training has some value. Well, let's come back to that. He's not saying your, your body's valueless. How many know your body's got to last as long as you do? Right. We talk about my money's got to last till I go. Well, so does your body. Like when your body goes, you're pretty much done. So you, you want your body to last as long as, as it's supposed to and as, as good a health as you can. So while your body isn't everything, it is the vehicle for your spirit, your soul. So, so you want to do everything you can. And Paul says, take care of your body. Honor God with your body. And at Bonita Valley, again, we're committed to helping in every way we can. You and me, 
We have all kinds of ways. We have, we have what we call faith and fitness. And it's all about, again, connecting our faith to our fitness because it all matters to God. There's a boot camp on Saturday mornings that will, kick your boot, well, will help you get in better boot camp shape. It's 8 to 9 o'clock every Saturday morning. And, and Gracelyn uh, Miller, she, she's our, our personal trainer. For, she does personal training for people. We have a training room. And so she does that. Um, they're also on, 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 on Monday nights. It's called Dance Fit. How many, if you like to dance, they dance. Now, others of you, you can't dance. Now, how do I know? Because I've seen you. You can't dance. I've been to wedding receptions. You can't, it's on video. You can't dance. But you don't have to be a great dancer to go to Dance Fit. Because it really, it's just, it's, it's moving with music. However you move, okay? It's just, it's just moving. If you want to live longer, just move. Just move forward. And so dance fit, and they have a blast, they have fun, there's music, and you won't even know you're exercising. You're just moving to music, and it's exercising. And then after, there's a volleyball that follows that. Um, even our seniors, thank God for our prime timers, and, and, and they meet on Tuesdays, and they're in the gym right now until we get the family center finished, and thank you for giving toward the remodel. We need that. We're, we're coming to the, to the finish line, but the finish line, we need to, we need to pay for it. So, so you're, you're faithful giving. Please, thank you for, for doing that. But let me show you what happens with our seniors. On the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of at, right after their meeting, they have their own fitness time. Our, our seniors are buff, man. Like They're like in, in, incredible. So they're, they're, they're moving because, you know what, as you get older, don't stop you got to move things to keep them working. So they do special exercise just for them, and they have fun. I watch them. They have fun. They really do have, they have an amazing time at, at, because your body matters, what you feed it, what you do with it, how you exercise. Now, now, this is just us again, you and me. How many know jumping to conclusions doesn't count as exercise? <laughs> okay. Like it's mental exercise. But no, you've actually got to move. Just keep moving. The best practice for building our habits is to examine them. What habits do I have now? What of my current habits are hurting me and which are helping me? Which one, God's, God, do you tell me needs to go and which one do you tell me I need to start? The earlier bad habits are detected, the better for removing them, recovering from them. And I say this again as, as honestly, transparently as I can. I try to have a physical every year, go see my doctor, do all the blood work, all the tests. Uh, I just went to the dentist like a week ago. I go twice a year for the cleaning stuff and, and checking it out. I, I have my dermatologist deal this week, like this is January, this is my month of getting checked out. How many have figured out when they, if they find a problem earlier, it's easy to deal with? And I've gone to dermatologists, it's like, hey, let's check out the spot, let's biopsy it. If we've got to deal with it, let's deal with it. If we don't, we don't. But how many know denial is not a game plan? Ignoring is not a game plan. And the same thing is true of our habits. God, see if there be any wicked way in me. Detect it. Because the sooner I deal with it, the sooner I can be delivered from it. The deeper it goes, the more difficult it becomes to deal with. And the same thing is true of good habits. The sooner I start them, the bigger, the better the harvest will be. And that leads us to practice number two. Practice number two for building better habits is systematically develop them. And I've chosen these words very, very intentionally. We develop systematically. There's got to be a system to development. It's exactly what Peter tells us. This is not just psychology or behaviorists. Watch this, 2 Peter 1, verse 5, the Apostle Peter writes, so don't lose a minute in, say it, building on what you've been given, complementing your basic faith, your trust with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love. These are all habits. Each dimension fitting into and, say it out loud, fitting into and developing the others. See, having it's not enough. You've got to develop it. Starting it is great, but you've got to grow it. And so Scripture challenges us to grow our habits. You grow your habits by developing them. 
Now, goals are good for setting direction, but systems or steps are needed for developing them. Let me say this again. This is the first month of a new year. I won't ask you to raise your hand this week. I think I'll talk about, we'll see about next week. But any of you have a New Year's resolution, we're like, we're, we're already more than halfway through January, and a lot of folks, it's over. That resolution is over. Now, the resolution was good, and it is a good thing to make resolutions. I have no problem with that. It's a good thing to be a goal setter. I've done a whole series on goals. Goals are incredibly important. They have shown in so many studies that that people with goals are people that achieve goals. If you don't have a goal, you'll never achieve it. Very, very important. But please understand that the goal sets a direction, but it won't get you there. Many people set a resolution, and the resolution was good. They just don't set a game plan to get there. You've got to have a system. You must have steps. So we tell someone, tell, I'm going to do this. Great. How are you going to do it? Well, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. Well, let me tell you, what you don't plan to do doesn't get done. So what are your steps? So the Bible is very specific in helping us, and God gives us all kinds of specific ways. And, and, and Peter says, develop the habits in your life. And how do we do that? Now, last August, our family, uh, Jewel, Jordan, Jackie, me, we all went to Chicago in August. And it went to a great leadership ministry conference, the Global Leadership Conference. It's held annually. And we went there with like 6,000 of our closest friends. Um, and it was like six, and people all over the world that were, that were dialed in. And it had some of my favorite speakers. It really did. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, I, I have like probably 25 of his books, and, and he was a speaker. Uh, Craig Rochelle, men's ministry, has used his materials a lot. Great writer, great pastor. He, he was kind of the, the leader, moderator of it. He was there. Uh, Condoleezza Rice was there. Um, she's amazing. And, and if you didn't know, she's a believer. Her dad was a pastor. Uh, she tells some amazing stories about her life and kind of how she functions and what happened in her life and the course of her life and God in her life. And, and so she was, was really inspirational. Dallas Jenkins, the guy, that, the chosen, uh, the director, the writer, talked about how he did it. And, and, and that came out of a failure in his life. And then he started The Chosen. And, and it's just blown up and become this worldwide, incredibly powerful, powerful presentation of Jesus' life. So there's all kinds of great speakers. And then one of the speakers for it, his name was James Clear. And James Clear is, is, uh, uh, is amazing, and he, he talked about life-transforming habits. He's written a, a great book. In fact, it's many of you, I'm sure, after the first service, many had already read it. They're in the process of reading it. Over 15 million have bought his book. And let me show you on the screens. It's simply titled Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones. Now, the reason we put these book pictures up there so you can take your phone, you can take a picture of it, and you can get it on, on like for me, I, I, I get all my books on Kindle, um, you know, so you can get it on book, you can get, a, you can get an audio book, whatever. It's an incredibly powerful book. Now, now, he's a believer. The book is not a Christian book, but it is full of Christian principles. And kind of the basic gist of at, why an atom, because atoms are very small. They're the building blocks of everything around us, but, but they're small, yet they're powerful. They're little, yet they're, in, they're impactful. And the same thing is true of habits. Little things can make a huge difference in our life. And so it's called uh, Atomic Habits. And, and, and he talked, he also has a free weekly newsletter, and I've signed up for that as well, because there's, I, I want to build the biggest, best habits to live the biggest and best life. And in his book, James offers four steps a four-step system to building better habits. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with it. You've got to buy the book because we don't have time in this session to do that. But I do want to walk you through. I just want to bullet four things he shares, and they're not just in his book. They're in the Bible, and, and that's what I love about truth is truth, that God has truth for us. And I want to walk you through because I want you and I want me to, to develop the best habits in our life. And to do that, I not only need the habit, I need the strategy. And I need steps. So let's walk through four steps that, that James Clear offers. I'll put them on the screens for you. Here's step one. Make it obvious. To develop a habit in your life, you must make it obvious. This is called a clue or a trigger. Every habit <clears throat> responds to a trigger. Your bad habits respond to a trigger. Oh, you go, I am not going to eat chocolate cake. And then you walk by working until it's on the table. It's like... Seeing it's the trigger. 
Every habit has a trigger. It's, it is. It's just like the autofill on our phone or our computer. When you start the word, it fills it in. So things trigger habits and our brain chunks habits. So understand how triggers work. They work in negative ways, but they can work in positive ways. If you want to build and develop a habit, you've got to be very intentional about your triggers. You set up cues for your brain. You set up cues for your heart, your attitude. Uh, let me just give you a, a quick example. If you say, you know what, I really want to read the Bible more this year, then give yourself a Bible cue. Put your Bible beside your bed. Or put your Bible on, 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 in your bathroom. Put your Bible somewhere where you're going to see it. And when you see it, they'll trick you. Yeah, I'm supposed to read that. Put it somewhere where you see Put things somewhere where you will see them. Do any of you, before you go to bed, and tomorrow I've got to remember this, so you, you put it out. Why do you put it out? Because it triggered. Uh, uh, yeah, I know I want to do that. If I put it out, I triggered doing that. Are, are you with me? I do the same thing like for running. Like I run, and I told you, I don't, I don't run because I love running. I love because of what, what, what running will, will accomplish. But I will put my running shoes out. Like do I always want to run? I seldom want to run. But when you fall over your running shoes, it's like, oh, yeah, I got to run. It reminds me of something that I may not, I, I need to do. It's a positive habit, but I will give myself triggers to things. Times will trigger it. I'll set alarms on my, on my phone to trigger it, trigger things. This is not just some behavioral psycholo psychology idea. It's by, let me show you, it's scripture, watch. The Apostle Paul talks about how he triggered his prayer and he triggered his praise. Philippians 1, verse 3. This is powerful. He writes, every time you cross my mind, Every time I think about you, he says, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each excla exclamation is a, say it, trigger. trigger. To what? Trigger. Wow. When I think about you, I pray. I mean, you know, if you're a parent, when you think about your kids, you should pray. Your kids trigger prayer. Your prayer life goes up when you have kids. Oh, God. There are things that trigger prayer. There are good things that trigger praise. Paul says, every time I think of you, I trigger prayer. I find myself praying for you. And the Greek word means all the time. I continually pray for you with a glad heart. Do you know how Paul built the habit of prayer? By thinking about people he wanted to pray for. That's how you trigger prayer. Like, I need to pray more. Why? Because things trigger prayer. So, so you want triggers in your life for the good habits. So think through. Be very intentional. Every habit you have has a trigger, the bad ones, but the good ones you've got to be very intentional about. Step two, make it attractive. Without some level of desire, without craving a change, we seldom go after the change. We're not motivated. And what we crave is not the activity, it's not the habit. There's a hunger that it satisfies. What am I trying to satisfy with this? There's something underneath. That's what's really driving us. James Clear writes, People don't crave smoking a cigarette. They crave the feeling of relief it provides. People aren't motivated by the act of brushing their teeth, but rather by the feeling and pleasure of a clean mouth. People don't desire turning on their TV. They desire entertainment. Oh, I love to turn it on. No, I love to be entertained. So beneath every habit you have, there's a desire. So you and I have to have the right desire and feed that desire. It's important to dial into what am I really desiring and how is this the best habit and the best path to accomplish it. So you trigger it. You desire, I'll give you an example. I read this years ago and there was a lady that wanted to lose weight. Common idea, people wanted to lose weight. And so her, her method, and I'm not saying I recommend it, but it, it, it worked for her. She cut out a picture of a beautiful swimsuit model and she put it inside her refrigerator. And when she would open the door, she would, oh, I want to look like that. And so she would say, I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to drink this because I want to look like that. And in two weeks, she had lost 10 pounds. Her husband had gained 10 pounds. Okay, so the same trigger doesn't work for everyone. Okay, that's kind of like, like the point. So, so different desires, different triggers. But, but what triggers it and what desire, the desire is what will fuel the habit and help de develop the habit. Step three, make it easy. Great habits must be doable, so we'll do them long enough that it becomes a great habit. If it's not easy, we won't do it enough to do it. We, we just quit, we give up on it. In fact, that's another 
of, of the neurologists and, and, and the brain scientists is that change is often threatening to us. And so when change happens, we, we, we can kick, our, our brain will kick into this fight or flight kind of deal. And so, I gotta change, and so, so, but when we make it easy, when we make it simple, our brain doesn't kind of go into high alert. And so we make it so that we're not, we don't want to run from it and we're not afraid of it. And so we start off small and we make it easy. That's not just some, again, psychological concept. Watch this. It's biblical, Zechariah 4, verse 10. Do not despise small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work, what? Begin. God says, don't despise when things start small. In fact, the biggest things always start small. If you start big, you'll wear out. You'll give up. You start small. It's vital to start small. For some of you just showing up today, some, it's, it's amazing. I believe that church is a good habit. I don't have to wake up and go, I go to church today? No, it's a habit of my life. I've already chunked it. I'm going to go. Even if the pastor's no good, I'm going to go because there's music's good and people are good and I need to connect with people. My, my, heart, my heart hurts because after COVID, many people who had a habit got out of the habit. And the writer of the Hebrews says, some of you have gotten into a bad habit of not showing up anymore. Now, thank God for the internet. Thank God for online stuff. But I got to tell you, online is not the same thing as in person. It's not. I don't just mean for church. I mean your relationship. Like, like Zoom is fine, but Zoom is not like seeing someone. Not like hugging someone. Yeah, you can get information. You can get some inspiration, but you never get connection. Connection is seeing and touching and hearing because most of communication is not what they say. It's body. It's how they respond. It's seeing things. And so many have gotten out of the habit, and it's a good habit to have. Why? Because it's valuable. It's one of my values, and I want my value to be automatic. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to be motivated for it because ha- it's a habit of my life. I don't wait to feel it. I've decided it. And so you and I make these kind of commitments. I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up for things. I'm going to be a part of them. It's an absolutely vital for us. Before you go to bed tonight, some of you, your goal, i got to read more of the Bible. Here's my challenge. Read two pages of the Bible before you go to sleep tonight. Just two pages. And stop. Only two. Don't keep reading. Now, my recommendation is don't start in Revelation. <laughs> don't start with the begats. He begat, begat, begat. I don't know who these people are. Hard name, hard name, hard name. Now, start in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They're great. The stories of Jesus. Just start. And just read two pages and stop. You go, but I'm right in the middle of a story. Just stop. You're going to want to read the next one, but just stop. Just two pages and stop. Why? You must start small. Must. Must start small. In fact, one, one writer on behaviors, it, it is so interesting. He talks about what he calls doing stupidly simple things. His challenge is, people, I hate to floss. Floss one tooth and stop. Just floss one. <laughs> Who would do that? Everybody can do that. That's the point. I can't floss them all. Just floss one. It's amazing. You might floss two, so just floss one. Just read one page. You go, I can't do that. I want to put on the screen, version Bible. You're going to even have a Bible. You can download this on your phone, on your computer. It'll remind you. It'll show up. It'll give you verses for the day. It's called version. There's millions that have gone out. We've shared it here before. It's powerful. It's free. People like free stuff. Uh, it'll, it'll alert you. Here's a Bible verse to read. You just get started, and you don't read the whole thing. You just read two pages, and you stop. You floss one tooth and you stop. And then you go, hey, I'll do the second one. The suggestion, get down on the floor. You, you want to get in shape? Do one push-up and stop. Now, for some, just go down and stop because you can't come back up. Just, just start with part of it. Okay. You got half of it. Now, why is that important? Here's why it's important. Newton's law of motion is once something gets in motion, it will continue in motion. There's a law of motion that once... You get it in motion, it will tend to stay in motion. And so some of us just have to create motion. And how do you create motion? With one simple step. Now many of us get incredibly, listen, and I'm like this. Like, we're going to work out, so we're going to work out for three hours, and we can't move for three months. Okay, like that's, (laughs) that's, I have. I've had times where I went without working out for a while, and then I worked out so hard that I couldn't, I couldn't lift my arms. You had to move your head to wash your hair. 
No, no, no. You're not going to, you don't plant and harvest in the same day. There's seasons. So just start small and a big harvest will come, but it must be done in small steps. Very important to understand the small steps, the stage that you and I must take. So you have got, I mean this with my whole, whole heart. What habit do you want to start? Start it today and just start it small. One simple, stupid step. It's not stupid to do it. The step just seems stupidly easy. But that's how great life-changing habits are developed. And then the fourth step, make it satisfying. Reward. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, Paul writes, all athletes are disciplined in their training. How? They do it to win a, what? Prize. That will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Nobody puts themselves through that if there's not something they're doing it for. So what are you doing it for? That's the reward. And Paul says what we do as believers, there's an eternal prize. Back to a verse we talked about last weekend from Hebrews 11, verse 26, about Moses. Watch again. Moses thought it was better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah because there's pain. There's pain in building a habit. There's pain in bad habits. Just choose your pain. Choose a pain that's profitable. He says, for the, he began to suffer for the sake of the Messiah, then to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead. We taught, play the movie, to the great, what? Reward. He was looking forward to a reward. It moved him. It motivated him. So what rewards are you focusing on? Are you looking to? When you get in the stage of your habit that it feels like more pain than gain. And you will go through that. There'll be a time in which you don't see anything. Come on. How many of you have ever, like, I'm going to start a diet. And so you diet all day. And you get on the scale at, at night. You weigh more than you start. How does that happen? <laughs> so here's my recommendation. Before you get on the scale, breathe out. Because air, I don't know what it weighs. But just breathe out. Get everything out you possibly can. Well, you don't get on the scale the first day you start a diet. You don't, you don't check. No, once you set the goal, once you start the steps... And what you have a reward in mind, you just you keep doing it because there is this latent, it'll look like nothing's happening for a while. And there's so many examples of this. It's, it's, it's the principle of compound interest that early on it doesn't look like anything's happening. But compound interest has a miracle to it that you keep doing little things over and over and over and it will turn out bigger results than you could have dreamed of. The same thing happens with our habits. Little things add up to big results, but you got to stay at it even when it doesn't seem like anything is happening. The reward for good physical habits, looking good, feeling better. Reward for financial habits is financial freedom and true riches. Reward for good relational habits is enriching partnerships, increased potential. Reward for good work habits, promotion and pay and influence. The reward for good spiritual habits is a God-blessed and an others-blessing life. Let me give you a principle of rewards. you got to understand this. What's rewarded gets repeated. With your children, what you reward, you get. With your animal, what you reward, you get. How do you think they got Shamu to jump out of the water? Oh, that would, because Shamu... Before he jumped out of the water, he was rewarded in the water. They put like a stick, like go over the stick, and they gave him a reward. Hey, I like this. And he jumped farther and farther and, and, and did, well, how do they train animals? They reward them. So your brain is wired for rewards. It, it, it fuels us. So you got you to gotta, you gotta celebrate your rewards to repeat your habits, your actions. That's why I love we call it celebrate recovery. You're not just recovering, you celebrate. And here's, here's the principle. But give yourself little rewards. Like if you start to run, so when I finish running, I get half a can. I like the whole candy bar. Like I just ran. But you give yourself rewards. When I finish this, here's a reward. Here's a reward. Here's a reward. You put little rewards that add up to the big reward because we seldom, listen, listen, listen. We seldom repeat what is not rewarded. So constantly in the scripture, it talks about rewarding, 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 rewarding. Why? Because one of the ways we develop the biggest, best habits, the fourth step is reward it, celebrate it. Because what you, what you reward and celebrate, you'll repeat. If you want to live the biggest and best life and experience the biggest and best year, you've got to build the biggest and best habits. 
Because our habits, to a great degree, determine the quality of our life. So if you want to up the quality of your life, we must up the quality of our habits. How do we do that? The Bible gives us two principles. Examine them. It's a great time at the beginning of a year to say, God, let's talk about our habits, my habits, the habits you want from me. Show me my ways that are hurtful and show me my ways that are helpful. Let me examine my ways. You know all my ways. Help me to see them. And then lead me in the everlasting way. Lead me in the right habits. Lead me in the right ways that you want me to live and think, respond. The second thing we need to do, if, if we're going to move forward, is we need to develop our habits. Having goals, I, I want a new habit. It's a, it's a great thing to have. Have goals. You should have goals. But the only way you'll get to your goals is with steps. So let the goal set your direction. Let the steps get you there. There must be a system to getting where we want to go. Again, James Clear offers us one very biblical. Make it obvious. Habits need triggers. They need clues. Make it attractive. Make it a desire. I go after what I desire. I'm not, I'm not after the routine. I'm after what it gets me, what it provides, where it takes me. Make it easy. Don't try to do it all in one day. In fact, God rejoices with small beginnings because small beginnings lead to big results. Sometimes big beginnings, we, we wear out, we give up, we quit. And finally make it satisfying. Celebrate. Let there be rewards because what is rewarded gets repeated. And my prayer and my belief if you and I will do these four things between now and the end of 2024, it's going to be the biggest, best year we have ever had. Why? Because half of what we do is habits. And if I can elevate my habits, I will elevate my life and my harvest and my future. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Father, please take these moments Teach us about our ways. David cried out, oh, Lord, search me. And we pray the same thing. Today I pray that you would search my ways, my habits. Show me the ones that are, are hurtful and damaging to me and to others. And show me the ones that are life-giving. And help me to build and follow and develop the most life-giving ways you give me to live. I ask you to, to close your eyes for a moment, not because it's, we're ashamed or it's secret. It's just, it's just focusing inward. It's looking with the eyes of our hearts. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, the biggest, best choice you'll ever make in your life is to say yes to God's offer of forgiveness and grace and change. Because real change happens on the inside. And right where you sit or online, wherever you are, whatever time, hour, I don't know where you are. I just know we have a God of divine appointments. He knows exactly where we are and exactly what we need. And you can pray a simple prayer. This isn't a formula prayer. Just say, God, I receive the gift of, of your forgiveness. I receive the gift of new life because I received Jesus. When he suffered and died on the cross, you were paying for me. And I say, yes, forgive me of my sins. I say you're the leader of my life and I will follow you. I commit to following you with all my heart. Now, Father, I pray for all those who prayed that with me. Your word says that you give us power to become sons and daughters. I pray for the rest of us who made that decision, but we need to grow it. We need to build it. We need to develop it. I pray for a family of faith that develops in every way because you help us to build the habits that build our life. And I thank you for helping us every step, every truth, every principle, every partnership. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.